do you do when you want to host your own server at home, don't want to run your own server rack, and buying a Raspberry Pi $50 computer for $200 seems just a little ridiculous. Lucky for you, there's a number of single board computer competitors coming to the market, but are they any good? Today's video is brought to you by Brilliant.org. Brilliant is an essential tool for professionals looking for development in a time-scarce world. Whether you're looking to boost your brain in math, data science, programming, or even physics, Brilliant has a course designed to keep you engaged with thousands of interactive lessons without slashing into your limited spare time. Even if you have little to no background with a given topic, Brilliant is built to provide strong foundational knowledge that you can take into more and more advanced concepts. Say you want to study physics. You can start small with foundational mechanics and eventually move into quantum objects. Brilliant is the best for busy people who want to boost their brain without busting their balls. Visit brilliant.org slash craft computing to try everything they have to offer for free for a full 30 days. And the first 200 people will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Again, that's brilliant.org slash craft computing. And thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. Ah yes, the Raspberry Pi. For nearly two years, everyone's darling home lab starter PC has been pretty much unobtainium. And despite a wealth of ARM-based Linux single board computers being readily available, the software and community support just isn't the same outside of Raspberry's friendly ecosystem. But what if I told you there's another platform that Linux has enjoyed decades worth of development and bug fixing on, and it's often forgotten by those looking for low power servers to run at home. This little micro server from Zima board features an Intel Celeron N3450 quad core CPU, up to eight gigabytes of memory, integrated graphics with quick sync video encoding, two SATA ports for connecting hard drives, dual gigabit ethernet ports, and even a PCI Express 2.0 X4 slot for expansion. There's also a single mini display port for video output, and the Zima board does boot into a full desktop OS. More on that in just a couple of minutes. All of that with an integrated heatsink, case, and included power supply for $199. It's easy to see why this little hackable single board computer is gaining traction in the self-hosted crowd so quickly. Out of the box, you get what I listed above and very little else. There's the Zima board PC itself, and it comes in three different configurations. You can choose from the $120 Zima board 216, which has a dual core Celeron N3350, two gigabytes of LPDDR4 memory, an integrated 16 gigabyte EMMC module, but also includes all of the expandability of the higher end models. There are also the Zima board 432 and 832 models, which feature upgraded quad-core Celeron N3450 CPUs, along with either four or eight gigabytes of memory and a slightly roomier 32 gigabyte EMMC. The $199 price point of the 832 is the suggested retail price, but I have seen these going for as little as $160 on Amazon and even as low as $100 flat for the 216 model. Even if the Raspberry Pi was back to its original pricing and was readily available, adding in a case, power supply, and storage, it's likely the Zima board would still be all around cheaper than a fully kitted out Pi. I have the 832 model on hand here, sent to me from Zima board for this review. Just like all review videos on this channel, no money changed hands, Zima board has no say or influence over the content in this video, and they don't get to see it go live before you do. But the funny thing about this particular video is I bought my own 832 just two days before they sent me an email asking me to review their 832. That's right, it's the YouTuber Integrity Reverse Card. Your move, commenters. First things first, the Zima board is powered by a standard 12 volt transformer with a three amp brick included in the box, as well as a couple of international plug adapters. But that leads me to one of my first complaints about the system, and it's that there's no power button on here. Assuming the use case is for this to be a compact server that's designed to run headless, it seems odd there's no way to gracefully power down the server without logging into the web interface or connecting to a keyboard and monitor. Along that same point, while there are a pair of Realtek Gigabit Ethernet ports on the Zima board, neither of them support power over Ethernet, which feels like a missed opportunity for use in a small business environment. Offices running a host of Unify equipment could easily power their entire network off of a single power cord if PoE had been implemented here. Overall, the Zima board is very well built, with an aluminum heatsink bolted to the top of the board with an acrylic panel covering the bottom. There's not much to look at inside, as all the components are soldered to a single PCB. 
Which begs the question, how exactly is this a hackable single board computer? There's no access to GPIO, there's no hardware to swap out or upgrade to. In fact, aside from the two SATA ports and the PCI slot, there's nothing you can really do with this that I would consider to be outside its expected use case. Except for hacking being one of Zima's expected use cases in this scenario, which doesn't seem to be possible. Out of the box, the Zima board is running Casa OS, a community-based open source operating system built on Debian and focused on making home-based services easy to get up and running. A lot of NAS hardware companies focus on one-click installations for common services like Plex, MB, Transmission, SyncThing, and the like. Casa OS instead uses Docker containers for everything, meaning apps don't have to be specifically built to run on this OS or even on this hardware. While I'm not a huge fan of Docker, as I always prefer running a full virtual machine for both update resilience and data separation, Docker does make sense to run on lower power servers like this one. Casa OS boots into a familiar GNOME desktop environment, and the management interface is just a local web server that you can access either from the Zima board itself via video output or from another PC on your network. One of the advertising points of the Zima board and Casa OS is that you can get your home media server up and running in less than 10 minutes. Of course, that is only under ideal circumstances, because software updates are still a thing. Casa OS is definitely easy to use, but it's not magic, especially on lower powered hardware. So updating this took me about 20 minutes. Both the Debian based OS and the Casa OS web server required updating before allowing me to continue, though there was little indication from Casa OS why its app store refused to load. Like I said, it took right around 20 minutes for both the OS and management interface to update. And then it really was just as easy as selecting the apps that I wanted to install, and in just a couple of clicks, I had them up and running. My one terabyte SSD that I connected was immediately seen by Casa OS and able to be added to storage. In less than 10 minutes, after all the updates, I had my one terabyte disk added and it installed MB, PyHole, and Vault Warden through the app store, though the process still wasn't perfect. While I was able to get PyHole and Vault Warden up and running without any issue, when it came to MB, it was a slightly different story. See, MB, and along with it, Plex, Nextcloud, or any other service that requires access to local files, the permissions in Casa OS by default don't allow it to access your external storage. The built-in storage manager also is only there for configuring physical drives, not for configuring files and folders. In addition to the storage manager, there is a files app installed by default. And while you're able to browse your storage, again, you cannot define permissions for apps like MB to access specific folders. It wasn't until I did some digging around for the settings of another application that I stumbled on the app settings menu for the installed Docker container, which allows you to show the directories each application has created for its own local storage. Unfortunately, the directories MB created for its movies and TV shows were on the EMMC drive, and no amount of tinkering in the files app, MB container settings, or locally inside Casa OS's desktop itself ever managed to get me access to my one terabyte SSD. I'm obviously not a Linux noob, and I still don't have MB working properly on this server. And at this point, I'm not really sure that I care if someone has a solution or not. The Zima board, and by extension Casa OS, claim to be the simplest way to set up your own home server. But even as a seasoned Linux vet, I couldn't get the storage pointed to where I wanted it, and the defaults used the wrong locations entirely. Documentation for Casa OS is practically non-existent as well, with their wiki being only a couple generic articles about running Docker, reinstalling Casa OS if there's a problem, or directing you to their Discord server. Look, Discord communities are fantastic for quick questions, but shouldn't be the sole support of an operating system, especially if that operating system is being shipped with a product like the Zima board. Now don't get me wrong, I still love the hardware and features that you get with the Zima board 832, especially at this price point. The server has no moving parts, it's incredibly well specced, and is basically just an x86 PC, meaning there's nothing stopping you from installing your own OS and services. So while Casa OS has an attractive interface for installing service applications like PyHole or Vault Warden, I'm going to find it hard to recommend it to anyone looking to use the Zima board as a NAS or a media vault, simply because of incomplete documentation and poor software implementations when it comes to file system permissions. 
So beyond Casa OS, I'm definitely happy with what's on display here. A Celeron quad-core processor with Intel QuickSync encoding support, which means you can transcode all of your Plex, MB, or Jellyfin libraries, up to 8GB of memory on board, and 32GB of built-in eMMC, along with two SATA ports, could make this a killer small form factor NAS box. Dual Realtek Gigabit Ethernet also puts it up there with a potential PFSense box or a simple machine to run network control software like Unify, Pi-hole, or AdGuard. So yes, it is absolutely fantastic hardware, but it doesn't mean I don't have any complaints about it. Yes, I would like to see a power button integrated onto the box, just so I could cleanly power it down without logging into a GUI interface. I'd also love to see power over ethernet implemented on one of the ports, simply to tidy up cable management and simplify deployments of this in either a home or small business situation. Also, while they do include one SATA power and data cable, this, allows for two SATA connections, and they will sell you the cable that supports power and data to both connections for an additional $10. But that feels like something that should have been included in the box in the first place. But because at the end of the day, this is just an x86 PC and actually a rather well-equipped one, you can do pretty much anything you wanna do with it. Some of the clever things that I've seen done with the Zima board are what Raid Owl did recently, where he set up his own Proxmox cluster with high availability failover using three Zima boards. And it's definitely worth the watch. Check out the video description and I'll drop you a link. So even though it has middling operating system support out of the box, it's not gonna stop me from recommending that you go pick up a Zima board 832 for yourself. Fantastic hardware, even better expandability, and I will have affiliate links down in the video description where you can buy one for your next home lab or small business project. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Mastodon at Craft Computing for daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and wanna help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon. Link is also down in the video description. And uh, stay tuned, new store options are coming soon. That's gonna do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. That's a good one. It's too bad Rhett didn't get it. Beer for today is from Surly Brewing Company. It is the Blast Beat Sultana IPA, clocking in at 6.7%. And yes, I did double check. That is Sultana, not Santana. Sultana Hop IPA. Fruity, dank, percussive. <laughs> I love the IPAs that when you crack them open and when you're pouring them at an arm's length, you can smell the the fruity notes on them. Like that that's how sweet and fruit forward the front of this beer is. And the flavor doesn't disappoint. This is one of those IPAs I want to say it's passion fruit and guava, not melon rind and orange peel. Like this is a this is a full fruit salad with a little bit of hot backing. And I'm here for it.